Okay, so welcome everybody to tonight's uh, Wellensburg Grange Lyceum Lecture. My name is Andy Buchanan. I'm the chair of the uh, committee that organizes the Lyceum Lectures. Um, as many of you know, I'm not our usual moderator, um, but um, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, preloading an excuse in case there's any uh, technical technical problems. Um, but uh, uh, we'd like to welcome you all tonight. Uh, the Wellensburg uh, Lyceum Lectures come to you from the beautiful renovated Grange Hall in upstate New York, in Wellensburg, New York. We've been doing these lectures for over 10 years now. Um, over the last year, for obvious reasons, we've been doing these lectures online. I know we're all dying to get back to, to in-person and the, and, the, and, the, and the pleasure of just being together with other people in the Grange Hall. Um, but having said that, there are some, there are some benefits to the uh, online format. We have people registered for tonight's lecture from, from as far away as, as Tokyo, Japan, New York City, South Carolina, Pittsburgh, whole, whole host of other places who obviously would not normally be able to make a, a Grange lecture. So we welcome, we welcome you to our, to, our, to our online community here. Um, so I'd like to thank the Pearsall Foundation um, for their generous uh, help in, 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 in enabling the Grange to uh, shift its programming online early, earlier this year. Um, this, we don't charge any admission for the uh, lecture series, but uh, we do encourage you, if you like what you see, uh, to make a uh, contribution uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the Wellensburg Grange Hall. You can find the details of how to do that on our, our, on our, on our website. Um, so tonight's meeting, uh, coming to you via Zoom, we are using the webinar format, which means that uh, you are unable to see the other participants, but if you want to, uh, to pose a question, and, and, and we hope that you do, um, you can do that by clicking on the Q&A button and uh, typing your question. If you see a question there that's already been asked by somebody else, you can uh, vote you can upvote that question. You can, and it will move it higher to the top of the uh, to the to, to the top of the agenda. Um, and we will get to the questions after we've uh, heard the presentation from tonight's speaker. Um, okay. So without further ado, the topic of this lecture series is, is entangled stories. Um, we kicked it off last week with a wonderful presentation on the entanglement between fungi and 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 trees. And tonight, a uh, slight change of pace, I guess. We're looking at the entanglement of different ways of war in the, uh, in, in the early American colonies. Our speaker tonight is, uh, is uh, Dr. Matt Kegel. Matt is a curator at, the, at Fort, Fort Ticonderoga. As many of you know, uh, a place with extremely deep and important roots uh, in, uh, in local history and in our local community. So uh, without further ado, Matt, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and turn the um, turn the program over to you. So welcome and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Excellent. Thank you. And, and thank you all for uh, for joining me and, and inviting me to speak with you this evening. It's a real pleasure to get to uh, get out to some of the other communities around Lake Champlain, which, uh, of course, is uh, where we work and live and uh, has such a rich and complex history, which is, I hope, what I can unpack today. So I'm going to share my screen here to get into my slides. Um, I, I should just say uh, briefly, uh, as um, Andy and Elizabeth asked me to uh, speak a little bit about my own background, um, that my work at Fort Ticonderoga as curator of the museum and my, my professional and academic training um, is not in pure history as it were, but rather in the study of material culture. Um, that is, I have uh, made a concerted effort to look at objects and use those objects as additional sources for the study of history beyond simply um, the written word or the printed word, depending on when we're talking about. Um, that's my background, um, although I find myself dealing with more of the kind of traditional historical topics in many respects, working at Fort Ticonderoga as we engage with the broader topics um, that our site prompts and uh, encourages us to explore. And, and this is one of those topics. Um, and so in some ways, this is um, a little bit of a departure from my primary work curating a collection of artifacts at the museum. However, at Fort Ticonderoga, and just to give you some uh, geographic perspective of where we are in the southern part of Lake Champlain, um, this uh, 
photograph was actually taken hovering over what's known as Mount Defiance, looking towards the Green Mountains in Vermont. Um, and you see the narrows of Lake Champlain with Fort Ticonderoga that some of you might be familiar with um, to the left side of the image and Mount Independence in Orwell, Vermont on the right side of the image. And I wanted to, to to bring this up here just to, to reframe even what we're talking about, hearing somebody come from Fort Ticonderoga. And if any of you have been to Fort Ticonderoga, if you are at all familiar with this historic site, you may think of a physical fortification and you can see it uh, down in that image. But we have increasingly been drawing out our perspective um, physically and historically. The Fort Ticonderoga Museum manages a 2,000 acre historic property that crosses both sides of Lake Champlain. And although the site is best known for this one fortification and for its role in the French and Indian War and the War of American Independence, um, its history is actually much more complex and much broader than that, going back to the beginning of the 17th century when we have the first written, at least, uh, accounts uh, of, of military action of combat on this site. And so even the military history of this site is one that is far broader um, than how it has traditionally been approached. And this lecture tonight, this talk tonight um, is really drawn out of that and how we're thinking about these different cultures of war in the Champlain Valley. But in some ways specifically, when we got to the topic of, of entangled histories as we were thinking about um, the, the series that this lecture is part of, I was, I was um, what was brought to mind um, was a conversation that I had had this summer um, over this painting, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, this hangs in the chambers of the Essex County Supervisors in Elizabethtown, New York. Um, and I, I, to be completely honest with you, have never seen this in person, although I've been by there. Uh, it was brought to my attention because of some controversy this summer um, over what it depicts and how it depicts it um, and how the event that it depicts is interpreted. Um, this being a painting of an engagement fought on the shores of Lake Champlain in 1609. Uh, the central figure here is Samuel de Champlain uh, in an engagement that's often known as Champlain's Battle. And both the painting itself, but also the way it was interpreted in its current installation with a published text that appeared in the National Geographic magazine in 1933. And I want to read you just an excerpt from this text because it's it's telling um, about how we think about this event, which has had a profound impact uh, on all the peoples of North America and repercussions beyond North America, in fact. So the text of this that I was asked to comment on includes this, and, and I will um, pause here and just note that the language in this is from 1933 and uh, reflects that. So it's it's uh, characterization of the Native Americans here is by no means how we would approach them today. I'm reading this from an historical point of view. It says, a sword girt figure in steel corselet stood proudly defiant before a band of hostile Indians. As the redskin warriors rush toward him with blood curdling war cries, the intrepid adventurer is unperturbed. Not until the savages approach within bowshot does he move, then he raises his flaring muzzled arquebus and fires. Three of the four leaden slugs find their mark. Two chiefs fall dead and one of their braves clutches at a mortal wound. Samuel de Champlain, the great French explorer to win the favor of the Hurons of the St. Lawrence country, thus brought war in that delectable land, which we now call the state of New York. And I think you can acknowledge, as, as I certainly did, um, that there's a, a lot of problematic language and, and a problematic interpretation uh, of this event, both in the script and in the, the painted image. The, the idea that Champlain brought war ignores the fact that this European was stepping into a continent with its own communities, its own cultures, its own conflicts, and its own wars. Um, Stone, Projectile points like this one at Fort Ticonderoga um, indicate that there is a human presence in this valley that dates back over 10,000 years. And this is completely ignored by the accounts, the presentation of Champlain's battle. What's more, if we go back to Champlain's own text, which is the, the only really primary source for this engagement, um, we get a very different impression. 
For one, he acknowledges very explicitly that he is entering a landscape shaped by conflict between native peoples that Europeans had not encountered before. In fact, he asks some of the uh, natives that he is with, part of a, a war party going to fight the Mohawk, uh, where he and the two Frenchmen with him form the minority of this military exposition, going as auxiliaries to existing native powers uh, in the St. Lawrence Valley. And he queries them asking, you know, why aren't there villages on the shores of these beautiful waterways? And they respond to him that the people there moved inland to escape the conflicts that had spread between various peoples in the Champlain Valley. And, and ultimately uh, he physically sees this landscape that has been altered by warfare. His perspective also is one not of, of overbearing against them, but of a soldier interrogating in some ways another martial culture. He asks them why they practice war the way they do, and they give him their reasons, and he responds with the reasons that uh, he as a Frenchman, as a European, uh, would conduct war. And so it is an interesting um, kind of encounter between martial cultures. The battle itself, which is often called Champlain's Battle, which is a title that I, I vehemently dislike, um, because although like this image, which is in Champlain's own work, it centralizes the figure of Champlain, the conflict that he was a part of here is about something much bigger and it was not initiated uh, even by uh, the, the three Frenchmen that accompanied this war party. But it is a profoundly significant event because although we can, not always say that a single event led to something else, it certainly is foremost in irrevocably altering patterns of warfare in Native America that have had profound repercussions, uh, again, across this continent and even beyond. And it's not at all uh, the engagement that is described or depicted uh, in that painting or the National Geographic article. Champlain did not stride out at the beginning of this gauge engagement. Um, he was actually behind the native warriors who opened their ranks for him to step forward uh, and to fire his shot. His uh, French compatriots were, were hiding in the wings, um, but there was more setup to the battle even prior to this because the two parties landed the night before and, and hurled insults at each other through the night. In fact, the pattern of warfare that Champlain describes is not that that Americans may think of when they think about Native American warfare. Um, it's not what becomes the norm for Native American warfare. It's something quite different. It's, it's fairly formalized. It's fairly ritualized. It's something that has been identified um, by historians and anthropologists in a number of cultures, um, pre-industrial cultures or, or Stone Age cultures that don't have uh, the kind of modern technologies that, that ultimately change the face of war. In fact, Champlain describes and he depicts in some of his other publications, um, the native warriors of America, in some cases carrying shields and even wearing armor um, made out of fiber to ward off the blows of the weapons that were available to them. And so in this context, his employment of a firearm is a dramatic moment. And the fact also that he describes loading this weapon with four ball uh, and striking three individuals is a casualty figure that is almost unheard of in native communities prior to this time. And what is so compelling is how radically Native Americans see the power that firearms can bring to bear and alter their own ways of war to employ these. Not only in this case, um, adapting the, the, what they fight for, but the way that they fight to counter the incredible power uh, that firearms bring to bear. And Native Americans relatively quickly adopt firearms, and I would argue become some of the best um, soldiers or fighting men in the use of firearms in the entire gunpowder age on either side of the Atlantic Ocean, especially uh, in proportion to their numbers. And over the course of the 17th century, we see tactics and technology and economy combining in such a way that Native Americans become incredibly successful fighters, employing firearms to their greatest advantage, the, the, even just the psychological power of the sound and the smoke of a firearm with the physical force of this weapon, which was far more powerful than the bows or the edged weapons that were available to native powers. By some estimates, um, firearms had six times the kinetic energy in the ball being fired from their barrel um, than a pre-contact Native American bow. So these are much more devastating weapons. 
but they also developed their tactics to be able to disengage with enemies when they were at the point of being pressed and overwhelmed. Um, this is a community that in many cases, not all, but in many cases, um, is suffering from demographic stresses, putting them often at a disadvantage, and they utilize tactics that allow them to make the best of their numbers and uh, the technologies that they were rapidly adopting. And in some cases, uh, various communities, particularly the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, which we can see identified on this map to the left, occupying a large swath of what is now Western New York, um, became incredibly powerful military and political blocks uh, in North America. And in fact, I think it's worth noting here that not only did they become literal existential threats to other native nations um, in the contest over trade uh, furs in particular, um, but also, it is a Native American power, it's the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, that prompts the first European regular soldiers to be sent to North America in 1665. The Carignan Salier Regiment of the French Army is dispatched by, by none other than a quite bellicose European leader, Louis XIV, not in response to the British military presence, but to the power of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy which I think speaks to the power that Native Americans in adopting these new technologies and tactics were able to wield on the continent, which meant that Europeans had to cater to them in the course of their negotiations with these powers. And that employment of, of getting Native American powers to either sit out of conflicts or join on their side became a dominating force uh, in North American diplomacy over the next two centuries. And here I think it's, it's worthwhile to pause, and I'm getting back into more solid ground of my, my material culture training, um, to acknowledge the technology that we're talking about here, because this is, by modern standards, a primitive technology, a smoothbore flintlock firearm. And yet, I will argue for at least another 50 or so years that this is likely the most successful firearm technology in human history. It has outlived at this point the modern metallic cartridge firing weapon um, and survived nearly two centuries of dramatic global change made in the millions responsible for the death and injury of millions more across the Atlantic and beyond. These firearms are central uh, to this story. And it's easy for us to dismiss these as old fashioned, but in the hands of Native Americans, um, they became incredibly effective weapons. Not only effective weapons, but Native Americans leveraged the manufacturers of these weapons to provide material objects like this, which is a fine French fusee or gun um, that were made in Europe specifically for the Native American trade. Uh, and beyond that, we know that guns fueled the expansion of empires across the Atlantic Ocean, both in the hands of armies, but as well as through trade. Guns lubricated and, and really underwrote the slave trade with West Africa, as well as the Native American trade here in North America. And I think too often we dismiss these as kind of obsolete technologies when in fact um, they are central to the expansion of imperial powers and the resistance to imperial powers uh, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And in fact, Native Americans even advanced the use of the flint lock, a more successful system than its predecessor, the match lock in the 17th century, uh, even before many European powers were using this, finding the advantages that it had uh, over the clumsier matchlock weapons much to their advantage. Now, throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Europeans struggled in many ways to combat the tactics that Native American powers were bringing against them to survive and to thrive in these new environments. Uh, in New France, like Champlain himself, uh, they found that often allying themselves with Native American powers provided them with the force they needed to meet their enemies. Anglo settlers had a somewhat different response, often finding the tactics Native American used um, as uncivilized. And, and in a strange way, European settlers in the Anglo world, in their some of their cultural habits and certainly their military operations, regressed somewhat, employing archaic practices of war that were falling out of favor in Europe. For instance, the organization of citizen-based militias as the primary military force rather than regular armies, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit. Um, or 
the, uh, the use of certain fortifications, which I'll also uh, address. They kind of fall back on older systems of war that, again, were, were falling out of use um, in Europe and rely on a mentality of combating what they see as this savage warfare, which persists well into American history. It's, it's worth remembering here that the last grievance of the Declaration of Independence is blaming King George for bringing, quote, on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an in undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. And what's interesting is that they use this as a justification to do exactly the same thing against Native American communities. Native Americans were so successful, I think, in waging war in some ways against Europeans to keep them off balance and to survive uh, that Europeans regress to the point of annihilation, what some authors have called extirpative war uh, against these. And they do it in many ways by employing the same tactics uh, that Native Americans used against Europeans. And Benjamin Church, who I show here, develops uh, during King Philip's War in the 1670s, uh, what becomes the American ranging tradition, which is basically to fight Indians using Indian methods. Uh, and this persists well into American history. But even this could only, in many cases, hold off Native American powers. Uh, and they often resorted to attacking civilian targets effectively, destroying villages and going after women and children um, as the only means by which Europeans could find to you know, finally end some of these conflicts. And th this is interesting because, as I note, as Americans, Anglo-Americans, Euro-Americans are regressing in some ways in their warfare, in Europe, warfare is advancing in another direction, that of a more limited uh, type of warfare. One that, especially in response to things like the, the incredible violence of the Thirty Years' War in Europe, um, are approaching institutions that we would recognize in a more modern sense today. So nation states themselves, um, a national army of paid full-time professional soldiers, the use of more resource heavy weaponry uh, like artillery that requires an immense amount um, of money, time and effort to produce, to develop, to maneuver and to employ on the battlefield and technologies that combine all of these things together like naval vessels and fortifications. And in doing so, Europeans create a kind of geometric vocabulary of this new pattern of warfare that is then expanded across the world. So wherever Europeans go, we still, to this day, can see the imprint um, of their way of war. And this is just a few snapshots I pulled from, from Google Maps um, to allow us to see this. In the top left is Fort Prince of Wales in Manitoba on Hudson's Bay. To its right, Fort Vredeburg in Indonesia in the former Dutch West Indies. Below that is the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, um, part military fortification, part slave trading post. Um, and to the left of that, the Real Felipe Fortress in Peru on the Pacific coast. And so we can quite literally still see the imprint of this developing European way of war from the late 17th century. And of course, fortifications existed in North America. However, they existed in different ways because they were adapting to different technologies and different ways of war. The, uh, Native American way of war that was being developed in the 17th century saw fortifications in the form of palisaded villages of both Native and Euro-American communities um, that I don't think would have been unfamiliar to the Normans, uh, you know, round stockaded fortifications. Uh, some of the fortifications built by the French in the St. Lawrence Valley in the late 17th century look positively medieval. Again, I think part of it, this almost regressive nature of warfare here in North America. But this would all change in the middle of the 1750s. Um, and this document in some part, I think, represents that. This is actually the orders to construct Fort Carillon, what I often describe as the birth certificate of Fort Ticonderoga, uh, because this fort was doing something different. Uh, this fort was actually in some ways defending another fort, Fort Saint-Frédéric uh, on Crown Point on Lake Champlain, which had been built in the 1730s, but which looked almost like a medieval castle rising from the lake shore, which <clears throat> was fine for the type of war that was being fought prior to this. But with the employment of more and more regular European soldiers and outgrowth of the development of the more limited patterns of warfare in Europe, that meant that artillery would be coming. It meant that these older fortifications could not withstand this new technology. And so Fort Ticonderoga had to be built to combat this. 
The fortification as it developed with rather low earthen and stone walls was a far cry from what had pre-existed it uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I think gets us to a point where these different cultures of war in North America begin to collide and to coalesce. And almost from the point that European regulars get to North America uh, during the expanding Seven Years' War, they begin to debate the merits of which is the more successful, um, the more prudent um, method of warfare. And this is an argument that has continued over time. And I don't want to come down on one side or another because I don't think that that's helpful to the discussion because the way war is waged in the middle of the 18th century is in any different point and place on a spectrum between that Native American way of war and between the European one. It is a hybrid conflict. And that's one of the things that makes the Seven Years' War, I think, so interesting um, to study. And throughout this time period, um, the, the balance of Native American versus European ways of war um, is often intertwined. Where we see them at their starkest contrast is when the objectives begin to diverge, and, and we don't see that in any place uh, better than we do at the siege of Fort William Henry in 1757, which is one of the most formalized European type encounters of the entire Seven Years War, despite the fact that it's also the same campaign that sees through the efforts of the governor of Canada of New France, the possibly largest military force of Native Americans ever assembled over the course of the entire 18th century. Uh, over the winter of, of 1756 into 1757, the French are able to muster a force of nearly 2,000 Native warriors coming from as far away as the Great Plains, modern day Iowa and the Dakotas. And they operate alongside a very formal European um, siege, uh, which represents for this time period the kind of the pinnacle of limited war, literally breaking down warfare, the messy business of war into a formula, a, an almost scientific uh, methodology in which not only can you save lives and treasure, uh, but honor as well. And <clears throat> these two ways of war are, are incompatible in many ways if the combatants don't fully appreciate um, their, uh, their allies. And this is exactly what happens um, as the Marquis de Montcalm, the French commander, um, basically overrides his native allies who he treats as subordinates rather than as equals as they had um, come to the field understanding. And so when he offers the garrison of Fort William Henry um, to surrender according to those terms of European warfare, uh, native warriors are completely left out of this and they take agency into their own hands and get what they feel is their due um, from participating in this military campaign. This is, uh, exploited as the massacre of Fort William Henry by Europeans on, on both sides of the conflict, to be completely honest with you. Um, and it ultimately helps feed into uh, a growing racialization of warfare in North America um, that reaches its peak in some ways by the, the 19th century, but was growing as an outgrowth um, of the, the development of these different ways of war, but didn't necessarily pre-exist them, uh, which is an interesting thing to consider. It hardened uh, these distinctions. Now, the implications of this is, of course, images like this, which um, starkly put into contrast Europeans and Native Americans of savagery and civilization, um, which uh, have pervaded popular discourse for centuries, um, even immediately in the wake of these events. What it did is it left the French army in many cases bereft of their Native allies who, who felt disgusted um, that they were not treated as equal partners. Um, it also exposed them to infectious disease, which decimated populations as far out as the Great Lakes. Um, and so by the climactic Battle of Carignan in 1758, uh, the French had very few native allies within that day, something the Marquis de Montcalm was more than happy uh, to promote, that this was a battle won by Europeans, by French soldiers, not by Native Americans, that he could use to justify moving more towards the European end of that spectrum. The challenge was, though, uh, that by this point of the Seven Years' War, the French, even if they had wanted to fight this more European war, uh, did not have the financial uh, or the logistical ability to wage it on the other side, or the political will in some cases, to wage it on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, just as the British were shifting in the other direction. And I think this is 
kind of exemplified um, by this painting in Fort Ticonderoga's collection by a uh, Royal Artillery Lieutenant who served in the French and Indian War here, depicting the camp of General Jeffrey Amherst's army at the southern end of Lake George, the, the actual site of the old Fort William Henry, um, that I think encapsulates how the British were employing not one over the other, but a simultaneous use of this American way of war through the use of, as you see in the foreground, not only Native Americans, um, but American Rangers uh, who were trained in these Native American tactics who brought this um, less limited form of war to their enemies, um, often with an incredible amount of savagery in their own right, um, and who almost always operated with other Native Americans uh, on their own side, learning from them in many cases. But in the background, of course, we see the logistical power of the developing British fiscal military state. And it was the conjunction of these things um, at the time that the French were, were withdrawing or being forced to withdraw from one aspect of these ways of war that the British are able to ultimately conquer Canada uh, during the course of the Seven Years' War, first taking Fort Carillon in 1759, as well as Fort Niagara, uh, and then ultimately driving on Quebec and, and Montreal itself, and forever uh, altering the map of North America. And the repercussions of these conflicts are ones we live with today. As I look to our north at the international border that is there now, this comes out of these conflicts uh, um, that scarred the continent of North America. And I think I'll, I'll kind of conclude my, my formal uh, component of this um, by reminding everyone that, that none of these things had to happen. We have to follow an arc from that encounter in 1609 that sees changes to communities, European and Native American, based on those initial encounters between these two cultures. And none of this was predetermined. Um, it evolved because of the interactions of all of these individuals uh, on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And I think we need to understand this complexity, that it's not as simple as this one man striding out uh, in front of the battle line. It is the complex interactions of these different cultures that has left us the world that we live in today that ultimately helps us, I think, recover the agency of people who have lost it who had it in the past um, and provide us with a fuller view um, of our past. And I think that it's important for us to consider the repercussions of these conflicts in the early modern period uh, because they deserve our critical attention as informed citizens of the modern world. And so with that, I will uh, close the formal component uh, of my presentation. Um, I'll drop this slide up there. Uh, I look forward to uh, any questions you may have, um, and I encourage you all to uh, reach out uh, both now and if not, uh, then afterwards to myself uh, and Fort Ticonderoga. Okay, Matt, great. Thank you so much for that really, really stimulating presentation. Um, so I encourage uh, the folks to um, post uh, questions in the uh, under the Q&A function there. Um, and uh, I will, I, I'll raise your questions with Matt. So please uh, feel free to, 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 to jump in. Um, the uh, quest, first question we have is from, for, from Marinel Bachman. Marinel says, uh, do, you, do you have uh, any evidence of the structure of Native American military groups? That is, did those who engaged in warfare have a different hierarchy from the tribal organization? Hmm. Um, that's a that's a very good question. Um, and I think to a certain extent, I don't want to make claims that are too broad about lots of different Native communities, because there's lots of different patterns of how Native American societies were structured across the continent. Um, one thing I, I think is, um, is worth saying uh, is that I don't get the sense from the research that I've been doing that there was, as develops in Europe, a, a group of military professionals. Um, you know, Native American warriors also hunted. They also contributed to their community and in, in some cases even um, contributed to uh, agriculture within these uh, various societies. Um, and I think this is, you know, in some ways, in, I, I, I don't know entirely if the American development of militias based on their own populations um, was you know, purely of their own development, but it, it mirrors in some ways how Native American societies um, operated. 
um, that this was just one aspect um, of life uh, at this time period. And certainly the weaponry that is being used in Native American communities, as I talked a bit about the, the actual technology, um, don't seem to have distinctions between you know, hunting weapons and weapons for war. They are, they are um, interchangeable in many cases. Um, whereas in European society, there are distinctly weapons made for war and weapons made for, uh, for hunting uh, and other purposes. Great. So, so a couple of people have asked me, Matt, asked me, Matt, can you, can, can you, uh, can you ID the folks in the six pack slide at the end of your talk? Oh, <laughs> let me go back here. Yeah. So um, this is, I, I put this together just to show some of the, um, the kind of the diversity of people that we find in, in early America. Um, at the top left of the screen is uh, William Phillips, who was a British artilleryman and the second in command of General John Burgoyne's expedition uh, in 1777. Uh, in the middle at the top is the Marquis de Montcalm. Um, this is a, an early 20th century portrait after an 18th century original. Um, the gentleman at the top right is Lemuel Haynes, uh, who was uh, an American of African descent, um, who served as a, a soldier during the War of Independence. Um, and, uh, and later became the, I believe the first uh, to, the, the first man of African descent to minister to a predominantly white congregation uh, in Rutland, Vermont. Um, if we go uh, down to the bottom left, that's Joseph Brandt, um, the uh, Iroquois leader who was a, a prominent um, advocate for his people um, throughout the late 18th century, um, who is um, ultimately pushed into, into Canada uh, after the end of the uh, War of Independence. Um, at the center is Harriet Ackland, who was a, a noblewoman who was the wife of um, a British officer in the War of Independence, uh, who accompanied uh, her husband on the campaigns here through the Champlain Valley and into the Hudson uh, and left some pretty riveting accounts of that. Um, and at the bottom right um, is a gentleman named John Small, uh, who is a Scottish uh, officer um, that served actually both the, the Dutch and the British militaries um, throughout the Seven Years' War, was wounded at the Battle of Carillon, um, and, and actually becomes the legal antagonist of uh, the holders of uh, title to land in what's now Vermont uh, that were claimed by the colony of New Hampshire in the early 1770s, um, before ultimately leading a group of of loyalists during the War of Independence um, and ending his career as the, I believe the governor of Jersey, the Channel Islands uh, in, in Europe. Um, but all of these people at one point or another over the course of their experiences of their lives were engaged in these military conflicts that again, I think have really shaped the world that, uh, that we live in and are, and are centered really around the Champlain Valley. Yeah, great. So here's another here's another great question. This is from Barry Goldstein. Barry says, what were the origins of conflicts between Native Americans prior to the arrival of the Europeans? So I guess what were the Iroquois and Huron uh, fighting about before Champlain jo 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 joined in? <laughs> That's that is a, a good question. Um, I I will say that going back into pre contact history is is not my specialty. Um, there are conflicts that come like conflicts do in all societies from access to resources, um, hunting grounds, um, certainly trade routes, uh, I think are one that, that um, again, in all societies we see conflict over and we see those in, in Native American communities as well. I believe that you know, the archeology span of, uh, again, even pre-contact um, <clears throat> or early contact Native American sites across North America has revealed artifacts coming from incredibly long distances, showing really complex um, networks of trade uh, across North America that I think most Europeans either didn't see or didn't care to see. Um, and of course, you know, commerce leads to, to community and connection, but it can also lead to conflict. Um, and so that's some of it. Um, I think the, the introduction of Europeans or the arrival of Europeans um, imposing themselves on the land exacerbated some of those, um, especially as Europeans push themselves into some of those trade networks um, and those you know, really restructured things. Uh, and, and some of those networks of trade and um, communication develop out of those uh, conflicts. You know, in the mid 17th century, there becomes a really uh, 
kind of deep and complex and insidious trade in, in firearms um, between various Native American powers like the Haudenosaunee, um, the Dutch, uh, as well as the English, um, all kind of supplying people. And Native powers are really good in those cases, uh, leveraging these Europeans against each other uh, to, to gain advantages uh, militarily and economically. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's uh, always more work to do on those pre or early contact periods. Um, it's, it's more challenging work in some ways because the sources are different from what we often use as historians. Um, we have to go back to types of <clears throat> information that Western trained historians don't necessarily always trust like oral traditions. Um, and uh, I think there's a great deal to be learned from that. And I think, you know, like myself, honestly, who approaches history from the view of, of material objects um, and, and physical things, um, the kind of traditional academic history has in some ways, uh, you know, not privileged those uh, in the past. I think there's growing acceptance of those. And I think that, you know, we will have to find ways to accommodate uh, other historical sources from outside of our own Western tradition as we explore um, some of these broader questions. So just sort of piggybacking on that, uh, Matt, there's a, yeah, a, 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 an anonymous attendee question here, um, which sort of relates very much to this. It's, the question is, did, did Native Americans ever make their own gunpowder-based firearms? So that's a, that's a really great question. And this is one of the, I think, the, the liabilities um, of the Native American adoption of firearms is they never fully develop the capability to manufacture these type of weapons on their own, in some ways because it, it doesn't make economic sense for them to. Um, you know, it better to get them from Europeans who are making them than develop an industry to do it themselves. Um, but they do understand the importance of not only the acquisition of weapons, but the maintenance of them. And um, there's been some excellent research that's been done recently by some historians on how Native Americans um, develop the ability to, to maintain weaponry that they're getting from European sources. And in some cases, in, uh, in treaties and negotiations uh, between various European and Native American powers, they specify not just guns, but also gunpowder, which is incredibly important to all of this, and shot, um, but also armorers, the actual individuals who have the technical skills to do this. Um, and so right there, you get the interesting uh, experience of Europeans or Euro-Americans who in some cases spend the rest of their lives with Native American communities as armorers to these uh, populations, which is a really fascinating thing to consider when we talk about the kind of intersection of these various cultures. So again, again, Matt, there's another another question which sort of piggybacks on this, which which is asking you as a, as a student of cultural items, what were some of the other artifacts bes beside the guns, the flintlocks and so on that were integral to the area and the history that you've that you're describing? Yeah, I mean, along with with firearms come uh, iron and steel tools, knives, hatchets, um, and that kind of thing, um, which again are, are much more effective than many of their stone counterparts. Um, and uh, those are, are readily adopted by Native American societies, again, who can easily uh, get these items from Europeans, you know, who are, who are willing and able and eager to supply them with these. Um, but along with that come, uh, I mean, things as simple as cloth. Cloth is, is hugely important and, and it becomes um, such a, a central part of trade to Native American communities that the use of cloth almost entirely supplants um, the use of hide-based uh, coverings um, for a variety of different things throughout, uh, throughout a, a huge swath uh, of North America. And uh, it, it is habitual to see Native Americans wearing manufactured European goods like this. And again, uh, they drive the development and production of material items in Europe because they won't just accept anything. They want what they want. And uh, manufacturers in Europe respond to that um, by producing uh, materials designed for the Native American trade. Although it is worth noting um, that 
by the 1760s at least, and it's, it's a part of the conflict that develops known as Pontiac's War after the, the Seven Years' War, and there are shades of it that also come up uh, certainly later in the, the Northwest Wars of the 1780s and 90s and, and later into the 19th century, although that's a little outside of my area, of a reaction within certain Native American communities against these manufactured goods and an interest in moving back to the traditional ways that they did things to be able to be self-supportive um, and to recover, you know, lost aspects of what was a hybridizing culture um, by that time. Yeah, great. So so just kind of zooming out a little bit here um, to the scope of campaigning, I guess this is James Davis. James, James asks, did the vast scope of the continent determine the style of fortifications that could be employed? For example, Fort Stanwix was essentially a stockade. You could not build a stone structure like Amherst fought, fought on the spot and for a particular occasion. Can you compare the stockade that George Washington was forced to surrender to a massive native force? Yeah, the, you know, the, the type of fortification that is built is, is determined to a certain extent by, you know, the, the geology uh, of where it's located, the availability of manpower to build it and money to support that, and also who the, who the potential enemy is. And so the further you get, um, Kind of away from the area or the time in which <clears throat> you might actually be facing European technology like cannon, um, you get different structures. In some cases, they are still made in that same kind of star-shaped um, profile that is that is kind of familiar, as I as I acknowledged, of and, and indicative of European um, colonial expansion. Um, but instead of being twenty feet thick, it's simply a line of of sticks. Um, and this is a difference where you see at uh, a fortification, you know, say in New York Harbor, Fort George at the southern tip of, of Manhattan Island, is a fortification with bastions, deep, thick ramparts meant to absorb cannon fire um, against a, a European enemy. Um, by the time you get to a place like Fort Stanwix, which is made during the, the French and Indian War, you get a fortification um, that is built in a similar fashion with thick ramparts, but made of wood and earth as opposed to stone, um, like Fort Carrion here at Ticonderoga, um, for that matter. By the time you push out to um, more frontier areas, I'm thinking of examples like Fort Frederick in, in Western Maryland, or even the French Fort de Chartres in the Illinois country, you see fortifications that have much, much thinner walls because the likelihood that they will encounter European artillery um, is significantly diminished. Um, and so the, the type of combat that is anticipated to a certain extent, along with these other factors that I've, I've mentioned, determines uh, how these forts are being constructed. Great. Okay. So a couple more actually specifically on, on, what, on, on, on the combat in Lake Champ. We're giving you a run for your money here, Matt. So, <laughs> So, 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 so Peter Slocum, Peter asks, uh, when the Native American allies told Champlain that their people had established settlements inland to avoid the fighting along the lakes and rivers, does that mean both on the uh, Vermont and the Adirondack, uh, and in the Adirondacks, do we have much evidence of those, of those settlements? Yeah, you know, Champlain's a, a little bit vague and you kind of have to interpret some of the, the things he's saying, which is one of the reasons that, for instance, even the location of that battle in 1609 has been contested between Crown Point and Ticonderoga. Um, I think in some ways he is, he is talking about further down the lake um, towards the, the, the Richelieu uh, Valley uh, rather than the area near um, what's now Ticonderoga. Um, which is again closer to the the Mohawk country, where they're they're going to find these Mohawk um, and to fight them. Uh, and I think he's talking about the kind of the southern extremities to a certain extent of um, the uh, the kind of Saint Lawrence Valley Native communities. Um, although again, we do know about the settlement on both the Vermont and the New York side of the lake, and there was probably a certain amount of movement side by side. There's good archaeologists who are work, doing work on um, you know Abenaki communities. Um, uh, in, in Vermont and, and the location of these communities. Um, but I think Champlain is more specifically looking at the, the northern part of the lake in, you know, what was to the, the Huron, Montagnier and, and uh, Algonquin warriors that he was going along with, part of their communities, um, villages and, and populations. So again, kind of piggybacking on that a little bit, Matt, there's a, there's a, there's a question about the insertion of, of, of permanent European settlements into the area. 
this is Miriam Khan, Miriam asked, were, were, were there any permanent European settlements in the area in the 1500s? Or was it just, were they just trading with the native, with the Native Americans? So patterns, how do the patterns of European settlement kind of fit into what you're just describing here? Yeah, um, you know, in the, in the Champlain Valley, there, there, there are no European settlements in the 1500s. Um, and, uh, and they really, you know, if we're thinking about the, <clears throat> the broad Champlain Valley to include the Southern Richelieu uh, Valley as well. It's really not until the end of the 17th century that we see developments of, of settlement, but they're, they're military settlements in some ways. It is the soldiers of the Carignan Salier Regiment that I mentioned in the 1660s, establishing some of the first, um, what are acknowledged as some of the first European settlements in um, you know, the, the islands in the middle of Lake Champlain and in, in what's now Vermont um, as a kind of a military frontier. And it remains in, in large part that until the middle of the 18th century, the French do establish a, uh, a small population center uh, at Chimney Point in Vermont opposite Crown Point and the French Fort Saint Frédéric there. Um, but you know, one of the interesting things that you know, we talk about at Fort Ticonderoga that, that makes it distinct in a lot of ways is that it is a fortification that grew out of war <clears throat> rather than a fortification that grew out of, of trade as a lot of other communities did. Um, and a lot of American and Canadian cities owe their origin to you know, these, these trading posts, these uh, habitations, you know, literally called the habitation uh, in New France, um, that you know, had settlement as their primary goal. Fort Carillon was developed as a military outpost, first and foremost. And although there was some ancillary Kind of community that developed around it, it was not a permanent settlement by any means. Um, and, and, you know, even after the War of Independence, it takes some time for Euro-Americans to, to fully kind of flood into the Champlain Valley to get, to, to get settlement. And when they start to do that after the, the Seven Years' War, it's, it's a factor of, you know, the expansion of the British um, imperial power through their victory in the Seven Years' War and their conquest of New France and Native American populations within both of what these powers claimed. So I, so I get, yeah, great. So I, I, I guess this again is kind of relating to this question. Uh, Mike smiles. Mike asked, were, were Native American, were the Native Americans of the Lake Champlain region incentivized by the concept of land grants or reservations, or, or versus guns and trade goods in bargaining for their allegiance to the British, French, or the revolutionaries? And I, I, what was that? What, what was motivating their what was incentivizing their political allegiance? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it varies depending on which community we're talking about. Um, and, and either side of Lake Champlain has some profound cultural differences. To the east, we're talking about in Algonquin speaking peoples, the, the um, Western Abenaki um, primarily, and to the west, we're talking about Iroquoian speakers. So these are different cultures. Um, these are different nations. Um, and they all have their own different regions. Um, I, I can't recall in the research that I've done in the 17th and 18th century seeing, you know, the idea of kind of, you know, reservation settlement um, in, in anything like what we would recognize as, as reservations of the 19th century, um, because most of these powers are still autonomous powers with a, with a fair amount of agency to determine their own fates. And they exist between what Europeans say they claim, but, but have, have no physical presence on. Um, and so they're able to, to leverage these powers against each other that way. It becomes a little more challenging when there aren't these additional powers to leverage against. Um, although one thing that is interesting to note is that the, the demographic expansion and the physical geographic expansion of Anglo uh, settlers um, and the conflict that that brings with it um, does see you know, Native American populations within you know, what are the kind of, to, to you know, Westerners at least, the, the kind of understood colonial boundaries of the British North American world. Um, and in some cases, communities like these, like the Stockbridge Mohican, um, were kind of groups that were themselves the result of the dislocation of pre-existing communities by warfare um, on the part of the, the Iroquois and, and other powers um, that forced these communities to kind of consolidate, to bring in others who had been similarly um, dispossessed. Um, and, and that's a pattern that to a certain extent we see across Native American communities. Um, you know, I don't think it's entirely um, similar, but we see examples of this in the, in the Mid-Atlantic and the kind of, you know, 
Trans-Allegheny West. We see it in the Ohio Valley. Um, we see it in the Seminole of Florida later by the 19th century, that Native American societies are incredibly resilient in bringing people in and kind of in some ways restructuring these societies in a way that Europeans aren't where, you know, your, your origin from a certain country is, is your identity. And, and even the creation of the United States is, is a challenge for Europeans to, uh, you know, acknowledge that this is a new nation, that, that people who are Britons that moved to North America don't just remain Britons. I mean, this underlies British impressment of uh, British sailors through the War of 1812. Um, but Native American communities are much more flexible and, you know, part of their, their impetus in going to war in many cases in the 17th century is to bring new people into these communities, to, to rebuild populations, to make up for the loss of, um, uh, of members of their communities. Um, and so identity uh, in the Native American world, and <clears throat> there are Native Americans, I'm sure, who can speak to this far better than I can, um, has, has a fluidity that European and you know, Anglo-American uh, society does not. Um, that, uh, that I think allows for a certain amount of, of flexibility. So there's just, just a couple more questions here. If, I think we'll try and, uh, we'll try and get, we'll try and uh, move through the last few, the last few yeah. here. This is, this is really, really a, a great discussion. And having said that, Matt, I'm gonna drop the, this is a big question, Rich Teitelbaum. Uh, can you describe what some of the specific military tactics the Native Americans used that gave trouble to the Europeans and which the Europeans later, later co copied? So. What did this kind of look like? Yeah, yeah, I, I alluded to this a little bit, but it, in some ways it is moving quickly. I mean, Native American warfare was, was fast, uh, especially compared to, to a lot of European warfare. Um, they, you know, one of the things I think that Native Americans did incredibly well is to maximize the, the initial shock of gunpowder weapons by very carefully laying ambushes um, we see this again and again throughout colonial and early American history as something that um, Euro-American armies are, are unprepared with. You know, perhaps the, the best example of this, um, uh, which is not purely a Native American army, it's partly French as well, is, is Braddock's defeat in the Monongahela uh, in 1755, which annihilates um, a, a force of British regulars commanded by a, a general of the British household guard. Um, and uh, that really sent shockwaves um, through, uh, through Anglo-American society. Um, you know, similarly, we, we see uh, engagements like Oriskany in 1777, where American militia are, you know, just brutalized by a Native American ambush. Uh, it continues after into the early federal period. One of the key figures from Fort Ticonderoga's history, General Arthur St. Clair, who was a Scottish officer in the British Army, um, uh, on the um, the northwest frontier, what's now Ohio, uh, along the Wabash River, meets with a stunning defeat by a Native American force uh, confederation that nearly matches in size, most likely, uh, the force that assembled here in 1757 um, and inflicts the single largest defeat by any uh, Native American military power on the United States military. Um, and so this is something that, uh, that the, the Anglo-American forces are, find themselves challenging or, or, or in a difficult position to respond to because the moment they try to, to counterattack, Native American forces typically dissolve. And of course, Europeans see this as being ungentlemanly and not standing up to fight. From the point of view of Native Americans, though, it makes perfect sense. Why would you stand up um, if you, if you, you know, suffer uh, losses? Um, and, you know, I think there's some evidence to show in various engagements that those times when Native American forces do stumble in or try to hold the ground against, you know, trained European troops, they, they get defeated um, at, at Bushy Run in Western Pennsylvania at the end of Pontiac's War, um, at the, the Battle of Newtown on the, the punitive expedition led by General John Sullivan against the Haudenosaunee in Western New York, um, you know, are times when, when Native American armies do something a little different, um, a little closer to that European war, and, and they suffer for it. Um, but that, that tactic of, of, of ambush, of, of fast movement, um, of, of, you know, again, dissolving when pressed to, to be able to continue that fight, um, to maximize their resources are, are hallmarks of this, uh, this way of war. Great. So there's a couple of questions here. This is one from Andrea Bauer. Andrea says, are there any accounts of armorers who were sent uh, by treaty to the Native American societies in, 
that, that you were talking about the armorers earlier? There, there are. Um, I, I, I cannot bring up the specific examples that I'm thinking of. Um, there's an excellent book. I'm happy to share the uh, um, the title for that was written recently, which is exactly about the impact of firearms in Native American communities. I think it's a, a clever book. Um, uh, I have a copy of it right here called Thunder Sticks by David Silverman, Firearms and the Violent Transformation of Native America, um, which gets into precisely some of these cases. And uh, I'll pass that uh, information along to our hosts um, so that they can share this and some other titles that I think are useful for understanding, uh, you know, in much greater detail what I've uh, introduced to you all this evening. So, so I'm going to pair this next couple of questions here, Matt, because the, 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 we're into the last uh, into the last few here. So, so Greg, uh, Pedrick, Greg says, uh, with the development of more iron uh, items, uh, when did forges arise to the need? When were for, when did forges develop in, in North America? And, and sort of paralleling, like, paralleling that, excuse me, a, a question from Tom and Mangano. Tom says, uh, what did Native Americans trade with the Europeans to obtain the items that they wanted? Guns, gunpowder, etc. Um, so to the first question of forges, um, I, I suppose I have a counter question, which is, are we talking about forges to do blacksmithing work or furnaces to, to actually produce from ore iron that can be used? Um, blacksmith shops to work iron, I think, turn up very early um, in uh, uh, kind of European colonization and expansion into North America. In fact, I would not be at all surprised, um, although I haven't looked into it in my great deal myself, if um, the kind of maritime, uh, you know, temporary settlements on the Atlantic coast by fishermen uh, and whalers didn't bring uh, forges in some form to uh, adapt and, and repair ironwork. It's, it's pretty typical on ships and uh, in military formations to do that. Uh, in the broader period, um, the uh, various colonial powers do start to develop their own uh, kind of industrial capability to to from ore from iron ore produce um, you know cast iron that can be used um, for various purposes. I know in in Saugus in the North Shore of Boston, they're doing this by the end of the 17th century. Um, it, it develops here and there. Um, in Canada, we see this at uh, Trois Rivières, at the Forge de Saint Maurice, um, which develops similarly a kind of a larger scale, you know, almost recognizably industrial capacity. Um, we see this happening in North America, but we never see it happening to the scale that it's being done in Europe. And so the Native American trade, by and large, in steel and iron items is coming from Europe, not from North America. Um, and of course, things can be adapted uh, by blacksmiths here, here on the continent, um, but it's being manufactured in Europe, which also goes to show, you know, the kind of the extent of these linkages where we have Native American customers influencing the manufacture of iron goods in, in Birmingham and London and Toul and France uh, and elsewhere. Um, and eventually uh, the United States begins to develop its own capabilities, but it's really not until the end of the, the 18th century that it, they're really doing that, I think, in any meaningful way, and, and certainly not for, you know, munitions of war, um, which even during the Revolutionary War, we have a, a real challenge uh, with with trying to obtain. I mean, one of the great kind of classical stories from Fort Ticonderoga is Henry Knox coming to get cannon. And one of the reasons he's coming here to get cannon is because we don't have an industry capable at that point of making the volume of cannon that we need to prosecute a war uh, against an enemy that is uh, armed and equipped as a European power of the period was. So here's another material culture question, uh, Matt. This is again from Marinel. Marin asks, given the importance of the lake in, in warfare, um, did you see influences in boat engineering in either direction, Native American influence on European boats or vice, vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. And I will I will get to that. I realized that I did not acknowledge the other question that was asked prior to that about what did Native American um, powers um, use to negotiate for these manufactured goods. Um, and in some cases, you know, it's it's trade in, in uh, hides, um, which is a kind of a familiar narrative. Um, that certainly forms a large part of it. But there's also a certain amount of manufactured goods that they get through diplomatic negotiations to ally themselves or to be neutral from your other European conflicts. Um, you know, goods, material goods are part of the diplomatic language of native communities. Um, you know, the, the English often disparagingly look at these things as trinkets and gifts, but it's a critical part of this, you know, uh, uh, negotiation, you know, and why should any power, you know, treat with you if you're not willing to provide them with these things um, that give them any benefit in entering these negotiations with you. 
Um, as far as watercraft go, um, there are, you know, of course, Native Americans uh, have a, a rich tradition of watercraft that varies in a lot of different places, depending on where you are, from uh, dugout craft of various types um, to uh, bark canoes of, of elm or birch. Um, and we, you know, we, we do see, I think, in some cases, perhaps the um, the employment of native watercraft by certain parties. I mean, I have various accounts of soldiers in canoes on, on Lake Champlain, as opposed to more European type vessels. Um, you know, what, what we also see is, is, you know, simply in some cases, quite literally the employment of, you know, oceanic European type uh, vessels on the inland waterways of North America, um, not only being built here uh, on Lake Champlain, the French built a number of, of vessels during the Seven Years' War, the British counter that, building a few after they capture Fort Ticonderoga in 1759, um, that by and large look like European ships. The French ones are a little different. They look a little more like kind of Mediterranean uh, ships than uh, the English ones, um, but nevertheless, it's a vocabulary that's, that's kind of Western European. Um, there is a flat-bottomed craft uh, called variously called a bateau that exists in various different sizes, um, quite simple to make, that becomes really the workhorse of uh, warfare, uh, maritime or lacustrine warfare uh, here in the north, um, which, you know, to a certain extent being, uh, you know, pointed in the bow and the stern it bears a certain resemblance to canoes, although I'm, I'm not sure if they uh, exactly derive from that, but I'm sure there's maritime historians who have done more work in that. Um, Europeans coming to North America certainly take an interest in uh, Native American watercraft. And in fact, um, one of the oldest surviving Native American canoes, birch canoes, um, was actually found not too long ago in a barn in uh, Cornwall, I think, which was brought back to England by a British officer who had served here during the War of Independence um, and was kind of I think, captivated by the, the qualities of this vessel. And it's not the only one that I've heard of with a similar backstory. Um, what, what is interesting, though, is that the the hybrid kind of uh, soldiers that uh, that uh, Europeans raised to combat Native Americans, the, the Rangers, um, are are most uh, documented during the Seven Years' War using whale boats uh, on Lake Champlain, of all things. Um, not a craft at all. We we typically associate, I think, with inland waterways like this, but one that had um, a certain amount of flexibility. Um, and could be could be moved quite fast with a, a strong group of men um, and become kind of, again, specifically used by these advanced parties fighting in, in more uh, Native American ways, as opposed to um, uh, Native American watercraft. Okay, great. Well, I think we can wrap it up with one final question, which kind of loops back to loops back to to, to Fort Ty. Um, James uh, Davis again, James just says, was Fort Ty Condoroga as we see it today, ever really defended? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, you know, one of the interesting things about the, the kind of the, the, the limited is was what uh, historians often refer to the type of war that develops in Europe in the late 17th and early 18th centuries um, is that the, the fort itself was in some ways the kind of uh, the, the fortification of last resort. You know, you didn't want to have to, to fight from the walls of your fortification if possible. Um, and the fort at Ticonderoga, Fort Carillon, was really never designed to be, you know, a, a, a full bastion. It was meant as the kind of the last resort, the, the place of, of fortification by a winter garrison. When the French sent armies into the field with native allies um, and Canadians at the beginning of the campaign season in May, there were far too many of them to ever be inside the fort itself. The barracks were only ever designed for 250 to 350 men, which was enough for a winter garrison to hold this place, to kind of hold out and hold the line against um, their enemies over the winter. Uh, but in the campaign season, which might often take you in different directions, uh, it, it wasn't used as a fortification itself. Um, and the battle in 1758 relied on uh, field works being created with a, a much larger circumference uh, on the heights just to the west of the fort itself, um, which also gave you something to fall back on if you were overwhelmed there. Um, and uh, that was the case in 1758. Uh, the British get a little closer in 1759 and, and came to the point of almost opening up their siege batteries against the fort before the French decided ultimately to withdraw. Um, 
the fort is captured, the physical fort itself is captured in 1775 by American revol revolutionaries, um, although it's not much of a battle. They basically rush in because the garrison doesn't even know there's a war on. Um, and uh, over the course of the American Revolution, the Americans similarly use Fort Ticonderoga, which by that point is in terrible shape, as the kind of center of a much broader network of fortifications, which still exists on our landscape. Fort Ticonderoga um, maintains what's probably the largest intact system of 18th century uh, earthen fortifications in all of North America, which was intended, again, to deepen um, the fortifications that the Americans would have to defend if they came to it, which through the, the mere construction of this and preparation of this in 1776, uh, in combination with the delaying action on Lake Champlain and Valcour Island uh, and the approaching winter uh, compelled the British to retreat. And so um, they prepared once again in 1777 to come back and literally attack the walls of Fort Ticonderoga, specifically bringing a massive siege train with uh, John Burgoyne's army that invaded that year. Um, but the only time that the fort itself may truly have been said uh, to have come under attack itself physically uh, was in a raid in late September of 1777, which is hardly the circumstance that we have in mind. Um, and it was actually attacked by um, fairly untrained uh, American militia and by and large successfully defended um, by actually German soldiers that were garrisoned in the fort itself. Um, and uh, we variously at the museum uh, do events and programs surrounding that event. So I encourage you to check back in with us and you'll, uh, you'll learn even more about that. Okay, so I think that's uh, I think we've got through all the questions there, Matt, which is which is fantastic, a, a great uh, a great selection. Um, so thank you, thank you again for uh, for a wonderful presentation and for fielding a, a broad a broad range of questions. I know we talked before that you would um, you would uh, g give us a list of reading for we can forward to for, for folks who are interested in pursuing this a little bit further. Obviously. Um, I'll uh, add to you your voice and encouraging people to visit the fort when that's possible and, uh, and, and, and experience not just the fort, but the broader, the broader network of fortifications that you were, that you were describing. So um, once again, um, thank you very much for your, for, for your time, for, for, for your stimulating conversation. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have you back to the Lyceum to deepen this at some point in the, in, in, in the future. So, so good night to everybody. And uh, as I said before, if you did, if you did want to, um, if you do want to make a contribution, um, uh, you can go to our website and do that. And um, just to uh, draw your attention, I think to the final slide here, um, the next, uh, next uh, uh, week's uh, Lyceum is Disentangling Art how do how the Adirondacks change landscape painting? So again, a little bit of a change of gear, but still in the in the in in the world of entangled uh, stories. Um, and we uh, we look forward to uh, we look forward to that next week. So thanks again, Matt, and we'll uh, we'll be in touch again soon. So wonderful. Night, Thank you all.